Apex Express, Asian Pacific Expression. Community and cultural coverage, music and calendar, new visions and voices, coming to you with an Asian Pacific Islander point of view. It's time to get on board the Apex Express. Good evening and welcome to Apex Express, news and views with an Asian and Asian American point of view. On tonight's show, we spotlight some feminist films and performances happening at the South Asian Film Festival that begins tonight in San Francisco and runs till the 25th of October. I'm your host and producer, Preeti Mangla Shekhar, and on board up with me is Lucretia Burton. Uh, stay tuned for also for a special feature on Filipino worker organizer Larry Itleon. Stay tuned. As part of showcasing the Third Eye South Asian Film Festival tonight, we begin with an interview I had recently with uh, performer and filmmaker Fauzia Mirza, whose work premieres at the festival, in fact, tomorrow. This segment uh, that you're going to hear first aired on Women's Magazine last week on KPFA and is a rebroadcast. The first highlight that we have about the festival is an interview um, with Fauzia Mirza, Fauzia Mirza is a Pakistani-Canadian queer performer and she is uh, she has a number of uh, features at this year's festival including uh including um a, a live performance called Me Myself and Sharmila and um she's here to um tell us about um both her performance and her two short films are you there with us uh, Fauzia yeah, I'm here. Welcome to our show. Hi, thanks for having me. Sure. So, um I had um I got to watch a short preview of your um performance online, but um would love to have you tell our listeners about what it is. First of all, who Sharmila is, Sharmila Tagore for a lot of our listeners who don't know her, and also how you came to do this um uh, performance. Yeah, so the the play that I'm doing at the festival is called Me, My Mom, and Sharmila. And it's about me and my relationship with my mother told to her shared love for Bollywood heroine Sharmila Tagore. And Sharmila Tagore is, um, she's a heroine in Indian films and in Bollywood films um, in the 1960s and 70s. And actually, you know, is a sort of a... Uh, part of a film, Bollywood film dynasty in many ways because, you know, her son is a guy named Saf Ali Khan, who's a very famous Bollywood actor and he's married to Karina Kapoor, who's also very well known in the industry. So, um, she's, you know, in the play, I uh, equate her to the likes of Meryl Streep, um, meets you know, Angelina Jolie kind of thing. So she's, she's definitely one of those iconic actresses of of uh, South Asian films and South Asian cinemas and actually was the muse for uh, a very famous Bengali film director named Satya Jitray who uh, who gave Sharmila Tagore her first start when she was uh, 13, 14 years old in uh, in his very famous Abu trilogies, which were sort of well well known and world renowned even by you know by by really well known American directors like Martin Scorsese. So she's definitely this, this icon and, uh, you know, film hero in, in our world. And, uh, you know, she's, I, I, the, the play is a lot about, about my mom and, and our relationship as well. And it's, you know, partially comedic. It's partially serious. It's, um, all heart. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be exciting to do it in San Francisco for the first time. Right, and you also have two short films coming up at this festival, right, uh, um, uh, Fauzia? Tell us a little bit about those two. Yeah, so, um, you know, they're, they're all really, really different kinds of projects. So there's uh, one short film called The First Session, which is a, uh, it's about a, it's a, 
six minute uh, short comedic film about two women who are in couple therapy uh and uh you know with an unconventional therapist and they they kind of get some some uh therapy advice through the healing power of the mango uh it stars uh parvesh china who's a really funny uh well-known south asian comedic actor he was um one of the leads in uh nbc show that used to be on called outsourced and in you've been in any number of TV shows since then um, on on different networks and also it stars Malvin McCarr who's a really good friend of mine from Chicago who now lives in LA and has been doing really really great things out in out in LA so that's that's one of the short films uh, and it's directed by uh, one of my favorite people to work with Ryan Logan who directed it and edited it and then the other short is completely different so that is a like a, but it's about an eight minute documentary, a little over eight minutes. It's called Reclaiming Pakistan. And that is, uh, that was, uh, directed by, uh, another very good friend of mine and a collaborator named Lisa Donato. Uh, Lisa Donato actually was from the Bay Area and lived there for a while. Now she's in Austin making, making films. But it, that is a project that's about a Pakistani activist named Muhammad Jabran Nasser and kind of uh, chronicles a little bit my experience of being in Pakistan right at the time when um, this this kind of revolutionary moment happened in Karachi, or excuse me, in, in Islamabad, where uh, Muhammad Jabran Nasser and some other people that he knew were... Um, uh, protesting the Lal Masjid or the Red Mosque and and the kind of politics and the imam of that space in December, January of, of this last, of, of this year and of 2014. So um, there's three completely different projects, three completely different stories, three completely different um, feelings. Uh, but yeah, I'm really excited to, to tween the shorts and then also to perform the show. Wonderful. And for those of you who just tuned in, we are in conversation with Fazia Mirza, who is a feminist scholar, performer and a third alum um, who um, will be performing and showcasing two of her short films at the upcoming Third Eye Film Festival. That's uh, T-H-I-R-D-I dot O-R-G. Um, passes are only available online and early bird passes um, actually just ended on October 7th, but you should still go online and get your passes today. And I want to play a small, uh, the trailer of your performance, me, my mom and Sharmila, Fazia, before we come back. Okay, sounds great. You don't know Sharmila Tagore? She's an actress. She's an Indian actress. She's one of the most iconic Indian actresses ever. Rami, I know I haven't done this much before. What's that? It's a hijab. Oh, is it permanent? I hope so. My mother was so beautiful. Like, Sharmila Tagore, beautiful. Religion is kind of like humans. Completely imperfect. I want to tell you, Mom, but I just feel like you're not going to want to hear. Because that her path wasn't necessarily my path. Wow, that's really a, quite a teaser for your performance. I'm curious to watch it. And the description of it says it's a hilarious and heartbreaking coming of age story peppered with personal anecdotes, pop culture, and even some South Asian history lessons. So, mm-hmm. so coming back to this performance that I'm very curious to watch, um, watch you, uh, perform at the CS Third Eye. Tell us a little bit more about how you, um, put it together and, and has your mom seen this? Um, so the, the play was, uh, it's produced by, uh, a company that I work with or have worked with, you know, over the last nine, 10 years called Catharsis Productions. And I've 
done sexual violence prevention work for them through performance for, you know, like I said, the nine or ten years. And we've toured um, universities and also military installations around the world. And they were really excited about me writing something that, that um, spoke to spoke to the stories that I wanted to share and spoke to me as a as an individual performer so they you know help make make this a reality and I worked with um, uh, a wonderful writer and uh, dramaturg in 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 and developer of, of content in Chicago called named Brian Golden and he's a really good friend of mine and and we worked together on it and it was directed by a woman named uh, Megan Beals McCarthy when we did the first iteration of it in Chicago um, and so so th- that that's kind of where it started and you know I started just by writing some stories and sharing them with Brian and 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 he would ask me questions and then you know we continued this process for a while I mean it took actually a couple of years to develop um, and then one day I uh, I saw that Shermila Togo was actually going to be in attendance at you know, at a Q and A session, it was like a conversation with Shermila Tagore kind of thing, um, like giant samosas, but no giant samosas, just Shermila Tagore. <laughs> and and, so, and to just to quickly uh, interrupt you, many of our, to many of our listeners who may not know Shermila Tagore, she's like an iconic film actress. So it's kind of like I don't know Elizabeth Taylor, maybe. Sure, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And so yeah, I went to see her and. Uh, I listened to the questions and I heard her speak and um, I was inspired to create the structure of the play around that experience. So the play is actually, you know, it's it's a, a girl, a woman going to a film screening and a Q&A that Shumila Tagore is going to be at. And the girl, the woman has a question for this actress and um, is, is really excited um, to ask a question about her eyes and the secret of her eyes. So, um, and, you know, in terms of wanting to, uh, you know, write the play, I, you know, I've definitely always wanted to do a, a one-person show. And, you know, I, I think being South Asian and Muslim and Pakistani and queer, it, you know, there's so many identities that to grapple with. And, um, and, 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 you know, I think everyone can relate to, to sort of having a mother, whether you know your mother or not, there's always sort of a struggle of, of, who is my mother? Who am I? And that, that, that I think knows no cultural or religious bounds. So, so, you know, my mom is a source of great inspiration for me in that respect. And uh, yeah, I wanted to tell stories. I don't think our stories are out there very much. I, I, I don't think we're telling our own stories. And, you know, I think there's a lot of shame and guilt in our culture surrounding telling our own stories and, and, and putting those stories into words and on stages and in front of people and then performing them. And so I just wanted to kind of break all that down and just do it. Um, you asked me about my mom. No, my mom has not seen the play. Um, this last time I just performed it at the Chicago South Asian Film Festival on October 4th. And my mom was not there because she was overseas, but, um, this iconic actress, Shermila Tagore, was actually in the audience. Oh, wow. And, um, yeah, I got to meet her and she, she saw my show, which was, uh, definitely a dream come true. And did she like it? Uh, I think so. Yeah, we had a great time. I mean, she, she was overwhelmed. It's also not something that's, I don't know, I don't know of anyone else who's uh, kind of written this kind of material uh, who's gotten the, the icon they're talking about, in our, at least in South Asian culture, to, to be in the audience in the same way of, of that era, anyway, of Bollywood, of, of Hindi films or of Indian cinema. So I think it, you know, I think it might be uh, a new experience for, for someone from, from, from like Bollywood as well to have this kind of homage in this way by somebody first generation American, um, you know, living in Chicago, living in the U S. So, uh, I think she liked it. I think, um, she, she was definitely very complimentary and, uh, you know, she signed my poster that has her face on it. And, uh, you know, we're, we're hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll do it again and maybe we'll do it in India. Wonderful. And, um, I want to, um, remind our listeners that this uh, performance and your two shorts are playing at the Third Eye Film Festival and your performance is on October 23rd which is which I think is a Friday right yeah uh, at 7 15 p.m. and for more information um, folks can go online at thirdeye.org thank you so much uh, Fazia, and I look forward to meeting you and watching your performance thank you so much looking forward to meeting you too can't wait great
That was a discussion I had last week with Pakistani Canadian performer and filmmaker Fauzia Mirza. Check out her show tomorrow at Third Eye at 7:15 p.m. at the New People Cinema. That's tomorrow Friday evening at the New People Cinema. And for tickets and more information, visit thirdeye.org. Up next, another festival spotlight of a feminist film. Stay tuned. You're listening to Apex Express. <laughs> decade, India has eliminated more girls than the number of Jews exterminated in the Holocaust. The day my husband and in-laws they came to know that I'm carrying twins, the first thing I was told was that they won't accept two daughters in their house. And if they are girls, I have to get an abortion done. My second daughter, I still remember my mother-in-law had a white chunni, the Indian scarf on her, and she was mourning. So that was a preview. Uh, that was a clip from a trailer of this film called Petals in the Dust: The Endangered Indian Girls, a film by local um, Bay Area filmmaker and producer Naina Pace Kaputi, who is the director of this film. And this film premiered at the San Francisco Documentary Film Festival and won Best Documentary at the at the San Francisco Global Movie Festival. And Naina has also worked on several short award-winning films, and she's also a founder of the Global Walk for India's Missing Girls in 2010 in San Francisco, which is an international awareness campaign on the violence and genocide um, of Indian women, of Indian girls that has taken place uh, across India. And um, a little bit about the context before we go into our recorded discussion with Naina. Um, the patriarchal practice of sun preference is a notorious phenomenon in across diverse South Asian cultures, which has led to this heinous practice of um, female infanticide, um, which is basically uh, killing of the newborn baby girl, uh, because a lot of families, and this cuts across both poor and rich families, and also cuts across caste and class and other barriers. And we know that this is a, you know, um, Amartya Sen noted um, Nobel Prize winning economist has said that there are 50 million women missing from India's population. So Naina Kaputi uh, have made, made a film about that called Petals in the Dust that is also featuring at this year's Third Eye as part of their focus on freedoms. And because Naina couldn't join us today on our show live, I had a discussion with her earlier this morning uh, about how she came to make this film and a little bit more about um, this film. Stay tuned. This is Preeti Shekhar and here to talk about her film, Petals in the Dust, is Naina Kaputi. Uh, welcome to our show, Naina. Thanks so much, Preeti, for having me on the show. And I'm especially excited because yesterday was International Day of the Girl. So, you know, what better way to spend the day after International the Day of the Girl than being interviewed for your show. So, thank you. Wonderful. So, why don't we begin by you telling us about how you came to make this film? You know, when I moved to the U.S. 13 years ago, I came here to study film and it was with the, with the goal of doing social, social justice films and, you know, initially I wanted to do a film on domestic violence in the South Asian community in the U.S. or I was living in San Francisco and, you know, the whole gun violence at that time in the, in the, uh, in San Francisco was something new to me and shocking. So I was thinking about doing a film about that. But then on a visit to India, when I visited a, an orphanage in, in, in South India, they, the supervisor there was telling me how the there were so few girls available for adoption because they were being they they were being killed and she said even before this orphanage was built they used to drown baby girls in the nearby lake and you know even though I grew up in India there was very little in the news at least while I was growing up about infanticide and you know and then I went home and did more research and I uh, you know read these shocking statistics that 15 million girls had been killed in the last century and 
Uh, I just knew at once that I had to draw a draw film to shed light on this heinous crime because I, I was just lucky to be born into a family where, you know, my father actually wanted four daughters. So he was very empowered. He was a very empowered man. And, you know, I, finally he had me and my brother, but he never discriminated between both of us, neither did my mom. We both had equal opportunities. In fact, I felt... You know, being a daughter was was wonderful because in some ways I felt he gave me more, uh, you know, more, I wouldn't say love, but, you know, more encouragement than my brother. So I just felt I needed to do this film to, you know, be a voice for the voiceless because I was lucky, but there were so many girls in India that didn't have that opportunity, that weren't having that opportunity. And so that's how the idea for the film came about. Right. And there are a lot of stark statistics in your film uh, that kind of highlight how, you know, what we know as a very patriarchal sociocultural context in a lot of societies, including uh, Indian society and the sun preference that has led to widespread practice of very heinous acts like female infanticide. So tell us a little bit more about some of the statistics that you surface in your film and that you use to tell your story. Sure. And I'm glad you brought up about, you know, the gender violence being, you know, happening all over because that's something I always tell my viewers that, you know, gender violence is universal. It happens across the globe, but it just manifests itself in different forms in different countries. And as an Indian woman, I felt I owed it to my country to shed light on what was happening there. And there are also lots of positive things happening, but I, yeah, first of all, the 50 million was, you know, that's more than the number of people killed in World War One or two, more than the number of people killed in the Holocaust. And I mean, all these were horrendous, uh, you know, crimes, but, you know, the pure girls are being killed just because they're female. And, uh, you know, they say in, because of the number of girls killed in the gender imbalance, they say in in 20 years' time, there's going to be 20% more men than women in India. And already, you know, we are, we are seeing the effects of this uh, uh, skewed gender ratio because, you know, one of the people I interviewed in my film, his, his name is uh, Shafiq Khan. He runs an organization in, in North India where he rescues women who are, uh, trafficked as brides because in many parts of North India there are not enough uh, women of marriageable age so men uh, go to these marriage brokers and the marriage brokers are really many of them act as traffickers so they you know they go to families in, in Kerala or in the North East where people are very poor and might not have enough money to pay as dowry and they say you know we'll get your daughter married in fact we'll give you money for your daughter and then these girls who come to the north they don't speak the language the culture is different and then they find, very often they find that they're married not just to one man man but all the men in the family and sometimes the whole goal is just to have make have them give birth to a boy and once a woman gives birth to a son she's then sold to another man there's not much again about this whole uh, trafficking issue yes we know trafficking happens in india but bride trafficking is something new and girls are also being trafficked from nepal and bangladesh and if many of them are child marriages these girls are really young and Either they're being sold by their parents or the parents are being duped into assuming the girl is going to be married into a family that will take care of her. That's also something that, you know, because a lot of the focus has been on infanticide and now, the you know, the, all these rapes. But bride trafficking is a huge problem in India and it's just going to make it worse. So what I'm hearing you say is the socioeconomic context in India has changed so much, especially, you know, post-globalization that 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 is also aggravating the way families, you know, treat girls and women and treat them as burdens of the family. Whereas in reality, we know that women actually are the biggest caretakers, which is the irony also. Um, I'm looking at your website and reading a little bit about the description of your film. It says uh, the film explores the cultural origins of this vast genocidal crime and includes the voices of activists and gender experts and and um, um, Nobel Prize um, winning economist uh, Marthia Sen had said that there are about 50 million women missing from India's population due to such practices. And one of the other things I also want would like you to highlight is um, two things. One is there are strong stories of survivors um, in your sure. in your film that kind of you know in this such a bleak and depressing context also show that women are also rising up as solutions where they can. So tell us a little bit about that, that I think I really liked about your film. Absolutely. So we do highlight stories of women in our film who are, you know, who have faced discrimination or faced violence, you know, but we 
Yes, what, what struck me about all these women, first they had the courage to come forward to share their stories. In India, it's not easy. We don't have shows like Oprah where people talk about, you know, their problems. Usually, if you have a problem, especially when it's just, uh, related to your gender, you keep it within your family. So my, you know, my, I have utmost respect for these women to come, to coming forward to share their stories. And all the women who spoke who were interviewed in my film said they did this because they felt that you know, it will give other women the courage to come forward and speak about it and to stand up for what is their right as a woman in, you know, India's, in the world's largest democracy. So one of the women, you know, very powerful women, woman is Sunita Adlikar. She was, her mom died when she was 16 days old and, you know, her father did not want a daughter. So when, when, you know, he was handed uh, the little girl and told to take care of her because a girl was born in her grandfather's house, he took the little girl and buried her. And luckily the grandfather, you know, sensed something was wrong and followed the father and was able to um, find where the little girl was buried and rescued her. And I, you know, the grandfather, again, in those days, a man res rescuing the daughter from infanticide was taboo. So the whole village rejected them and they had to move from village to village because no one wanted to have a girl in that village that was not wanted by her father. But anyway, she was brought up by a grandfather, educated, and she has gone on to become, uh, you know, she's a politician now, she's written a book, and she also also advocates for girls. So she goes down her village and, you know, promotes uh, the value of daughters, you know, and people see her as a role model. So she goes and speaks to the men and tells them that your wives get involved in my movement. And because of her, they have found, she lives in a village called Latur. They have found that the gender ratios have really improved since she's taken on this role of encouraging women and promoting the value of daughters. So she went through so much trauma in her life. She, she could have just turned in on herself, but no, she said, I want to improve the lives of other women. She, for me, is a wonderful example of someone who has, you know, not only survived a very traumatic experience at a young age, but also is doing something to improve, not only improve the lives of women, but to show that women are equal to the men and getting not just the women involved but the men as well and she has a very supportive husband so that's another thing that is very positive for me in, in the film you know starting with my own life and my father was very supportive and now my husband so I think you know also having the men involved and then there was another woman who was rejected by her family and then thrown out by her husband because she didn't bring in enough dowry actually eventually went on to adopt a little girl who was abandoned in a garbage bin in South India because she was one of four daughters and also had a horrific skin disease. And this woman told me that she had such a miserable life when she was growing up because she was a girl. And, you know, again, another woman, instead of turning in on herself and feeling sorry for herself, she said, I want to give my daughter, let's adopt this girl because I want to give her quality of life and the love and the care and the empowerment that I didn't get. And she not only is educating and taking care of this girl, but she also helps other low-income women become self-sufficient by teaching them tailoring skills. So another remarkable woman. And then another woman who's been fighting for justice for the last 10 years is Dr. Mittu Kurana. She had she was pregnant with twin daughters and her husband, even though they were really wealthy, her husband did not want her to have daughters. You know, she said they could have, they could afford to have 10 daughters in the house if they wanted to. And they did an illegal sex termination test. And when they found that she was pregnant with girls, you know, they started harassing her to terminate her pregnancy. And, she, you know, in India it's illegal to find out the gender of your baby. So she, she found out about this and she, you know, she went to court and has taken her husband to court. And she's been fighting for justice for 10 years and, you know, not given up despite that threat, despite all kinds of harassment from her husband, the hospital, the legal authorities. And she just emailed me last week and said, after 10 years of fighting for justice, the case was dismissed, her husband and the uh, uh, hospital have gone scot free. And not only that, her husband might get full custody for the twin daughters that he didn't even want. Thing, yeah, and at the same time, you're a strong woman and one of the few women that's come forward to uh, fight this battle.
Right, and this is a major case. I remember made a lot of news as a positive example of you know a woman standing up and speaking out uh, against a lot of odds. And right, uh, so that's I'm um, glad you highlighted that in your film. And one of the things also, Nana, uh, I'd like us to talk about before we wrap up is also in the diaspora. One of the things that we know is uh, these kind of um, attitudes, the patriarchy that persists through generations, doesn't just die when people leave their home countries and migrate. The South Asian di- diaspora is notorious for just, you know, bringing in, for carrying on these practices here in new and different ways as medical technologies, you know, kind of evolve. Sure. And that is something you also highlight in your film. So speak to that. Tell our listeners a little bit about about that practice. And this is something I've also uh, learned about here when I came here as a journalist to the Bay Area and the, the, the facilities available for South Asian couples that are offered in the name of gender balancing and other things, but actually are uh, helping to reinforce these deep-seated notions of patriarchal discrimination. Absolutely. So, you know, I, I just wanted to back give you a little backstory. So one assumes that, you know, gender discrimination, gender violence happens among the poor, the uneducated in India. And first of all, I wanted to change that. And that's why in my film, you know, both in India and the Indian diaspora, I show educated, wealthy women who are also facing this violence. In fact, I met women and families in India, you know, and many of the tr- people in the tribal areas and even in the, you know, uh, in the rural, uh, who are low income actually want daughters because they see daughters equal to sons. So I wanted to, it's a myth and I wanted to change that. It happens across the board, across religions, across education, across you know, the whole socioeconomic structure. So that was one thing. And I, what was shocking for me was to find that it, as you said, you know, it also it also existed here in the U.S. Yes, the U.S. also has various forms of gender violence. I mean, you have date, date rape and, you know, there's, there is a lot of sexual violence, domestic violence. But I just assume that Indians who came here, especially since it's a lot of the educated India, Indians, which, you know, have, uh, have changed their way of looking at women. And I, you know, connected with a non-profit here, my three, uh, we actually have the president of my three, Sonia Pelia, featured in our film. And, you know, the statistics on domestic violence and how educated, wealthy or middle in- income women are treated even here in the U.S. and in Canada was very shocking to me. And then the whole issue of sun preference, you know, that there are fertility clinics, um, both, I mean, in the U.S. because it's legal here to, you know, use this technology called pre-implantation, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, diagnosis where you can find out the gender of the embryo, um, and then, you know, only embryos of the desired sex are implanted into the woman. And I have seen, you know, Indian newspapers in the U.S. advertise this technology. Uh, there was even a newspaper in in Canada which uh, ran an advertisement for a uh, for the same technology, uh, uh, so, uh, you know, that was offered by a, a U.S. Uh, uh, company. So, you know, the, it's legal in the U.S., so Indians from Canada, from the U.K., from India are flying in here to have, uh, you know, male embryos implanted. So, you know, the, look, look what technology done, does. It. I mean, at this stage, female embryos, you know, will not even make it beyond the pre tutish They're just discarded. I even asked, uh, you know, one of these fertility clinics, and they, I said, what do you do with the female embryos? And they say, you know, they're discarded. And they even said that most Indian uh, couples want to have sons and, uh, you know, are using this, spending, you know, thousands of dollars. So these, again, are educated, wealthy people that can have, daughters that, you know, you would assume would see women as equal to men and, and uh, you know, why? why? I still don't understand. I mean, after all these years of working on the film, I still don't understand why people are so desperate as sons, you know, as you and I discussed earlier. In many cases, women are the caregivers of their parents when they get old. They're the ones who provide financial and emotional support. I mean, there are lots of wonderful sons out there too, but why? I mean, we have had women prime ministers, women presidents, the women goddesses. I mean, we have, you know, I just, I mean, now we have women in the army, in the air force. So why this desperation to have a son is something that I still, you know, it's so ingrained in our psyche. How do we change it? And that's something that I think all of us together, because as, as long as pe- people, you know, it all starts with how one sees, uh, you know, daughters, because then it transcends into how one sees one's wives, how one treats women in the community. So I, my solution is, you know, we need from a very young age to teach our sons 
that girls are equal, to, be it through you know sporting activities, through gender studies in schools, through you know our communities and at home, and also teach our girls to see themselves as equal to boys and to see themselves as empowered and not to stand up for any kind of discrimination at any stage in their life. I think from, I believe that's the solution that starts from a very young age and uh, you know. And then, as they, and that we set good examples, good role models for these children, not just women, but men who are, you know, empowered, like my father, and I'm sure a lot of other amazing men in the community who are, who don't even think about whether it's a boy or girl. They just see them as their children and as equals. If you're just tuning an interview I had earlier today with Naina Pace Kaputi, a local Bay Area filmmaker and producer, on her latest film, on her first film actually, Petals in the Dust, uh, which is one of the films um, spotlighted at this year's uh, Third Eye Film Festival. Right. And I also, you know, want to highlight something that you kind of also through the voices of the different experts and the activists that you also um, um, highlight in your film that um, India does, you know, for all the challenges and the backlashes and the rising uh, forms of, you know, new and different kinds of forms of gender-based violence also has a very strong women's movement um, that has worked hard and tirelessly to really bring these issues to the forefront and even the Delhi gang rape that you kind of highlight is, mm-hmm. you know, and, and the subsequent coverage um, by the media and globally also the outrage against what's happening in India. It, it did not come out of nowhere. It came because of years and years of hard work of uh, grassroots women's groups and activists really pushing for that. So I think that's something we often tend to forget too because um, in, change cannot come through individuals it, and it, can, it cannot happen instantly or through, you know, one firm or one book but it happens through years and years and that's probably also why I think we especially here in the Bay Area I think are notoriously impatient you know like we have these apps and newfangled technologies and we are so impatient that we think mm-hmm. that you know things can change in an instant but right. really the, you know it takes a long time for change and it takes organizing and protests and so there's need for that kind of real time activism in this day and age of Facebook and activism so we need to really also highlight that you know, those voices also that you kind of surface in your film are important. Right. Sorry, and that's why in the film, you know, almost every segment ends with a non-profit and what kind of work they've already done because part of my film, besides creating awareness, is to uh, get people to support these uh, these organizations because I, I, I handpicked a few organizations that, like you said that have worked for years on trying to bring about change organizations and individuals so right, hopefully like Mochana, right? I'm trying to remember the words. Mochana, yeah they yeah. were one yeah they've been I mean they're the ones who changed the face to, who even brought domestic violence and you know the dowry deaths to the forefront no one even spoke about it and they've done such amazing work in in San Francisco there's a lawyer in 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 Mumbai who does undercover you know uh, you know, she sends in. I'm sorry, I'm going to just cut that because I don't know how to yeah. word it. But yeah, we must not definitely. Great. So we are over 20 minutes of to wrap up, um, Naina. But quickly, if you want to tell our listeners how they can find out more about your film and also how they can watch it at the uh, Third Eye. Okay, awesome. So uh, thank you, Preeti, for having me on the show, and I'm really excited to uh, to have my film screen at the Third Eye. International South Asian Festival in Palo Alto. It's going to be playing on November 1st at 2.45 p.m. Um, when I started making the film, one of my goals was to get into this festival because I know they're so supportive of women's issues. And for more information and to view the trailer, you can go to my website, petalsinthedust.com. And thank you so much again for having me and for helping me promote this film and this cause, Preeti. Absolutely. And uh, also urge our listeners to check out thirdeye.org. T H I R D I dot O R G for uh, to find out about films at the festival, about Nina's film, and also to buy tickets online. So thank you, Nina, and good luck. Thanks, Preeti. Thanks, and thanks for making the time to. Sure. That was a discussion I had with local filmmaker Nina Caputi about her film Petals in the Dust that screens at Third Eye this year on November first in Palo Alto at the South Bay edition of the festival. Up next, we bring you a special feature put together by Sarah Blanco and Frank Freewheeling Sterling for Apex Express. On September 26th, 
2015, myself, Frank Sterling, Full Circle and La Onda Crew, representing Pacifica Radio, headed south to Deleno, California, to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the 1965 Grape Strikes and Boycott. It was held on the United Farm Workers, the UFW's, historic 40-acre site. I went because many people in my family have worked in the grape fields of Deleno, so I attended as a Chicana, connecting with my cultural history, reconnecting with my roots, and I went to celebrate the heroes who risked their livelihoods in the fight for basic rights in the fields, like access to drinking water, access to bathrooms, and the fight for increased wages. I went also as a reporter to tell their stories, but instead I have discovered something more. There is a story of the highest caliber that has to be told. It is that of the Filipino workers and Larry Itliong. I have known this story, but only to a certain extent. Earlier in the week, in preparation for the journey from Berkeley to Deleno, I contacted the UFW and was able to record the stories of two women, both original strikers. Both women attributed the start of the grape strikes to the Filipino workers. Esther Urandai, in particular, was part of the 1965 strike, and she would later run the UFW membership department and was also in charge of accounting for the Robert F. Kennedy Medical Plan. When I began my interview with her, she started with a history about how her own family joined the strike. We were working out in the fields at the time at DM Steel and Sons. And during working hours, we heard conversation from other workers that the Filipino workers, the organization AWOC, had walked out on strike. So we decided to walk out and strike and support. Everyone whose stories I recorded, basically everywhere I turned, including found in the music by Teatro Campesino, there is a recurring background story. But it seems that the history of the heroism and activism of the Filipino workers and Larry Itliong should really be more at the forefront because they were the reason that the grape strikes started to begin with. The day of the 50th anniversary festivities, Filipino strikers were honored Original striker John Armington takes the stage to talk about his father, Bob Armington. John delivers a speech to us from his experience because as a child, he was present during the farm laborer meetings. Here we listen as he talks about the vote that took place on September 7th, the day the vote to go on strike took place. It's also the day before the strikes of September 8th began. Here's an excerpt of John Armington's speech. The meeting was to start at three o'clock. By noon, the Filipino hall was filled out the doors with workers and the foremen. And that meeting went for hours, crying, worrying, wondering, hoping to change something. And finally, after many, many, many hours, Larry asked if there could be a uh, vote. And that day they said, who agrees? The whole room raised its hand. The Manungs raised their hands. And the next day at three o'clock in the morning, we met at the hall and the strike began. <laughs> the strike would not have started if it weren't for Larry Gitlion. AWOC came as an organization because there had been so many strikes Filipinos had been involved in in Seattle, Anchorage, Stockton, over many times, many years. So they struggled many, many times and so often lost. And they wondered, would this win? Within a week to 10 days, the discussions were had. Caesar agreed earlier than he wanted. But the strike continued with a joint cooperation between the AWOC Filipinos and the farm workers under Cesar Chavez. <laughs> In his speech, John Armington not only tells us that his father Bob Armington made the formal motion to strike, 
during the historic strike vote meeting on September 7th, but he also credits Larry Itliong. So, so far in the week, I had been hearing about Larry Itliong, but I wanted to hear his voice myself. Here is an excerpt from a video titled, The Filipino Americans. Larry stands in front of a video camera in 1974, and this is nine years after the first grape strikes and boycott had provided workers with contracts, cold running water, and access to bathrooms. Basic civil rights. He reflects back on the early days of the Filipino farm laborer experience, which really relates to the farm laborer experience of all ethnicities and cultures across this nation. Uh, we were brought here primarily to be exploited uh, on cheap labor to where the employers could make a lot of money. Now, for the many years that we have been here, uh, Filipinos have tried to organize themselves uh, to the extent to try to bring about a better working condition and also to increase their wages, which are the lowest in the country. Uh, and this is struggle... It was not easy for the Filipinos to develop their organization because the forces of the employers are against them. The city, the state, uh, legislators are all against uh, these people because of the fact that we are minorities uh, which has different color. A sense of fearless wisdom and toughness in the matter-of-fact way that Larry Itliong was speaking in 1974. It's crucial to note that prior to the grape strikes of 1965, Larry had already been a labor organizer for decades with various organizations. Larry's actions and words make him a man ahead of his time. In the Leno 2015, the day of the 50th anniversary celebration, Amidst the crowd, which included Bobby Kennedy Jr., Dolores Huerta, and Chris Christofferson, I saw a man who appeared very easygoing, but somehow commanded attention. The front of his t-shirt portrayed the likeness and name Larry Itliong. It was Larry's son, Johnny. Many people were interviewing him, and I had the chance to interview him as well, since he wanted to reveal key facts. He and I spoke off to the side, beneath a tree, as the ceremonies continued on stage. Well, let me be clear why I'm here. I'm here to help correct the narrative that has been put out for many years about the UFW. My father asked Chavez to join the strike. There's a few things that need to be cleared up about the whole history of the union. People do not realize that the NFWA was an association that was not a union, and that AWOC, Agricultural Workers Organization Committee, which my father was the strike director for West Coast, and one month prior started a strike in Coachella. So the strike actually started in Coachella one month before September 7th when they took the vote and the 8th when they walked out of the fields. And this is the history that's not being told by the UFW. So now, through at least two different people, I have been informed that not only was Larry Itliong a key player, but he really was the catalyst for the historic strike and that there should be more UFW founders in addition to Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta. In fact, Johnny Leong mentioned others as well. Let me name off the names. Ben Gaines, Philip Veracruz, Pete Velasco, Andy Umatan, and even El Rojas. And the other, and the other one was Gilbert Padilla and they should be given the credit that is due them. There is something to be said about how some people identify with their own cultural heroes the most, but if there's more to be told, more heroes to share in the action, should we not all embrace them? In order to maintain the momentum of the 1965 activism, we have to honor the Filipino workers and Larry at Leonc. Whenever the grape strike is remembered, we can all keep our heroes, but never forget those who shared in their heroism. As a Chicana, one of my heroes is Dolores Huerta. Here is her closing statement from the podium at the 50th anniversary celebration. Organizing. One more thing, we got to make sure we get involved in voting. This is the legacy of the union. We got people registered to vote and we made them get out to vote so that we can get good people to represent them, okay? Que viva la Unión de Campesinos! And then this is Larry Leong speaking in 1974. 
eventually we figured that uh, in order for us really to develop the kind of vehicle that uh, we need to use to help ourselves, we have to get involved in the political structure of this country so that we can then have an input as to the kind of legislation that needs to be passed to where protection such as our right to organize is going to be invited. And also we as uh, Filipinos in this country must have that kind of position. Clearly, Lariat Leong is at the core of the legacy and heroes of the UFW. And this is the story that needs to be told, along with that of Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez, regardless of her culture. Lariat Leong is a hero to all farm laborers and activists. Before Lariat Leong's son, Johnny, and I parted ways in Deleno, he wanted to share additional reasoning for why he was there. I'm here, I'm here for my father, I'm here for my family. And I'm here, here for all of us because to me, this is such a great story that has been tainted by a, a story and not historical fact. And how more powerful could it be to have the true history come out and share, share in the limelight, you know, that my father should have gotten, but he didn't care about. There is a lot of effort to not only remember Larry Itliong, but to have him remembered and portrayed accurately by the UFW and really by all of us whenever we remember and speak about the 1965 Great Grape Strikes and Boycott. For Pacifica Radio and Apex Express, I'm Sarah Blanco. You just heard a special feature put together by Sarah Blanco and Frank Sterling on Larry Tleong. Thank you, Sarah and Frank, for sharing your piece um, on our show. That brings us to almost an end to our show, but a quick community calendar announcement before we wrap up tonight's show. Hashtag Survived and Punished, if you don't know yet is uh, going around on the Twitter and uh, social media circles and highlights yet another face of the brutal and pervasive prison industrial complex in the US and the need to build radical coalitions to end the criminalization of domestic and sexual violence survivors. This Saturday, October 24th, there's an important film screening followed by a discussion. Uh, the film is Out in the Night, followed by a Q&A with Renata Hill of the New Jersey Four. A note from the organizers, the survival actions of so many survivors of domestic and or sexual violence have been criminalized by the state. Some survivors are still in prison or on parole. Some are languishing in immigration detention. Some are confined to their homes and some live with the threat of incarceration or deportation at any moment. Some did not make it out of prison alive. The risk of criminalization is particularly high for black women. 85 to 90 percent of people in women's prisons experienced sexual and or domestic violence before they were incarcerated. There are so many more stories and we have so much work to do. Join us for this powerful film, powerful speakers and strategic conversations to map out where we go from here. This uh, wonderful event is organized by the California Coalition for Women Prisoners the Free Marissa Now Coalition and uh, Stand with Nan Hui, along with the Center for Race and Gender. So do check it out. For more information on our community calendar, to subscribe to our podcasts or listen to our archives, hit up our website apexexpress.org. If you have a show or a segment idea or you'd like to get involved with our collective, email us at apex at kpfa.org. I've been your host and producer on tonight's show, Preeti Mangla Shekhar, and on board with me has been Lucretia Burton. Our outro and intro music is by Asian Crisis. Thank you for listening and tune in next week again for our pre-Halloween edition of Apex Express. Mm-hmm.